morning, everyone. I hope uh, my voice is coming out clear. Um, this is probably the 1000th uh, virtual event that I am attending, uh, but still I am always very nervous about um, you know, communications and, and, and virtual uh, contact. Um, I, I see that the mic volume is going up and down, so I take it that it's good. Um, anyways, good morning again, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this lecture by the fourth holder of Tun Hussein On Chair in International Studies at the Institute of Strategic and International Studies Malaysia, or better known as ISIS. Ladies and gentlemen, the establishment of uh, the Tun Hussein On Chair is in honor of Tun Hussein's leadership towards shaping Malaysia's national and foreign policy. The late Tun Hussein was also ISIS's founding father and his first chairman. The work of the chair has enhanced ISIS Malaysia's capability in providing input for shaping the opinions of national leaders and influential voices in the region on foreign policy and strategic issues, especially those that affect Malaysia's national interests. Today, continuing the tradition of esteemed scholars as the Tun Hussein Chair, Emeritus Professor Dr. Dr. Shad Salim Faruqi will speak on a topic that is as timeless as it is current human rights, reflections of the East, and perceptions of the West. The question that Prof. Shad intends to address this morning are those that Malaysia, like many of those of the so-called East, have had to grapple with since the eve of our independence. How do we square nation building with respecting the rights of communities and individuals? In our fight, for, uh, in our fight against communism, for instance, about half a million people were relocated to new villages. In our struggle against communalism, we embark upon a program of social engineering that transform our nation. Hard decisions needed to be made to keep this nation together. Viewed from today's prism, some of these measures would probably be seen as breaches of human rights. But this is not just a matter of curiosity for historians. It was not long ago when our leaders were engaged in the Asian values debate. This surrounded the belief that Asians were inherently collectivists, that they placed greater emphasis on the rights of the community rather than those of the individual. The debate may have initially died, some would argue, in the aftermath of the Asian financial crisis of the late 1990s, but I suspect it is far from over. The rise of China and the way it has successfully weathered the COVID-19 pandemic have predictably raised questions about whether there is an alternative and perhaps better way that nations could and should organize themselves. This strikes at the heart of assumptions about Western liberalism, including democracy and human rights. And it raises the issue that have long preoccupied those that admire the Western ideals of human rights, while wanting to see them tempered by the reality of governance. There are few people other than, there are few people other than Prof. Shah that I believe can tackle this singularly vexed subject. Prof. Shah is known to many of us as a scholar of constitutional law. His extensive scholarly work on the Malaysian constitution has put him in a position of being able to discern and appreciate the trade-offs that certain historical, political, and social contexts have forced upon those tasks with balancing idealism and reality, principles and purpose, universalism, and local context. I therefore look forward to his lecture, and I'm sure that, his, that this interaction will enrich all of us here today. In my honor, and in the privilege that I have as the Chief Executive of ISIS Malaysia, I would like to invite Emeritus Professor Dr. Dr. Shad Salim Faruqi to deliver his lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Don Harizal. Uh, and uh, may I begin with Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah and good morning. Um, um, thank you to all the distinguished participants, uh, Jahanan Fihir, Don Shariman, Ali and all others. I'm honored and humbled 
uh, this invitation to speak about an extremely controversial and nebulous topic that is full of genuine conflicts of learned opinions. Dan Harizal has beautifully summed up the debate and the dilemmas, and I can only elaborate on them uh, further. I'm on slide number three now. Uh, now, the challenge of the topic is multiplied by the multidimensional concept of human right and its expanding borders. In the Western history of human rights, political and civil rights were the first concern, and understandably so. Socioeconomic protection followed soon thereafter. Right to sustainable development is a more recent concern. There is also the idea of the rights of future generations. And of course, peace and security provide the environment for the flourishing of human rights. Surely in ASEAN, that is one of the uh, important pillars of our human rights declaration. Now, given the fact that human rights has so many dimensions, uh, we have to acknowledge that some societies do badly in one dimension but better in others. For example, many Asian and African nations go poorly on political and civil liberties due to preventive detention, lack of press freedom, religious persecution, torture, extrajudicial executions. However, the record of alleviating poverty and disease is often commendable. And as Don Harizal pointed out, China is an excellent example. Malaysia is another. Despite many flaws in our constitutional and political setup, we have 63 years of uh, peace, security, stability, and prosperity. No region, no religion, no race is at war uh, with the other. Europe and America score fairly well on political and civil rights within their borders. But sadly, they indulge in horrendous violations abroad through wars, invasions, toppling of elected regimes, economic embargoes, sale of weapons of mass destruction to nations that can even hardly afford food, export of toxic wastes, and unfair trade practices. For example, despite the COVID-19 catastrophe, the 1994 WTO, World Trade Organization, intellectual property provisions are being vigorously enforced against the third world by Western corporations. 16% of the high income countries have secured 60% of the vaccine. 84% of the poor countries will have access to this vaccine only by the end of 2023. It seems that intellectual property rights are taking precedence over colored lives. Now, looking at uh, uh, such issues, um, one is tempted to observe that determining whether a human right is involved and whether the human right has been violated is not an exercise that can ever be conducted objectively, fairly, and impartially. May I put it this way, that on this issue, we are all hopelessly encapsulated. We live in a capsule of time, space, uh, culture, religion, and obviously, we need to listen to each other to arrive at uh, discovering our commonalities. Uh, next one. Despite the challenge of subjectivity, I wish to submit that this is an age of human rights, at least an age of human rights advocacy. Uh, the quest for the inalienable rights of human beings has gained universal appeal. It is now generally recognized that state sovereignty is a shield against external aggression. It cannot be used as a sword against one's own nationals. As Martin Luther King said, abusers anywhere deserve condemnation because injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The idea of human rights, 
has gained universal appeal. Even many authoritarian nations often um, articulate ideals of human rights. So the idea of human rights has gained universal appeal, but there remain deep differences on the substantive details and content of the human rights ideals. A universal core or paradigm seems to be surrounded by a penumbra of fringe in which the great minds of the East and the West do not meet. Let me just illustrate. So there may be, there, there is general agreement on freedom of speech, but where the pornography is part of freedom of speech and um, 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 blasphemy is part of freedom of speech on that many people, many nations respectfully disagree with each other. Now, at this point, I wish to clarify and concede that neither the, S, neither the East nor the West is a homogeneous zone. Within each region and nation, diversity abounds and relativity of values exists. When using terms like the West and the East, North and South, Occident and Orient, I'm using the terms to refer to ancient value systems and not to geography. For example, Australia is situated in Southeast Asia, but has more cultural affinity with the West than with its colored Asian neighbors. Now, despite the homogenization, if I may use that word, or Americanization that globalization is bringing, many differences between America and Asia remain. Recognition of many core rights has not wiped away discord on a number of issues on which the reflections of the East and the perceptions of the West differ considerably. I have selected 14 such areas. May I please go, go to slide 16. The first one is socioeconomic rights versus civil and political liberties. Are socioeconomic rights entitled to the same protection as civil and political liberties. Now, um, right away, I have to say that international law recognizes the connection between human rights and poverty alleviation. Uh, this is covered by Article 11 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, Article 4 of the Vienna Declaration, the United Nations Declaration on Eradication of Hunger. Unfortunately, many of the Western dominated human rights uh, dialogues tend to concentrate on civil and political liberties and seize them as the foundation on which socioeconomic justice can be built. Most of the Western constitutions in their Bill of Human Rights, a chapter on human rights, do not mention the right to food, water, shelter, health, education, and other socioeconomic necessities of life. Contrast this with the Indian constitution, where there is a chapter on directive principles of state policy, making it mandatory for the state to enforce some socioeconomic measures. Not also Africa's Banjul Charter, where there is tender concern for socioeconomic rights. Now, at the other extreme is the argument of some Asian developmentalists that political freedoms must wait till a certain level of economic development is attained. My humble view is that such sequencing or prioritization is self-defeating. Bread and ballot, food and freedom must go hand in hand. Human rights are indivisible, interdependent and interrelated. Political and civil liberties cannot be separated from socioeconomic protections because political and legal principles alone cannot ensure a regime of human rights. Human rights provisions in our textbooks are not enough. They must produce results. They must be evaluated functionally. It's not what the law says, it's what it does that matters. It's not the content of the law, it's the consequence of the law that matters. I now go to the uh, issue number two, absolutism versus relativism. The Asian values debate, 
is there one universal concept of human rights or are there many conceptions? The universalist perspective is supported by most Western nations and I have to say by the Western educated elite of Asia. It holds that human rights values are universal, that, that the impulses of human rights are recognized in a large number of international treaties. It is argued by some that the Asian values argument is a crude attempt to avoid compliance with international standards. Some even go to the extent of saying that Asian values, if they exist at all, are inferior to Western values. Now, uh, on the other hand, I wish to point out that uh, the proponents of the Asian values argument can draw on the famous folks guys theory. Folks guys, the spirit of the people. Folks guys theory of historicism, that law, everywhere in the world law, is a reflection of the spirit of the people. It is relative to time and to territory. Value pluralism is an undeniable reality. And not only between nations, within nations, within groups, within the family, <laughs> there are differences of uh, uh, value perceptions. So relativists also point to the teaching of sociology that context often determines content. The relativists also submit that the Western claim that human rights values are universal is in some areas a thinly disguised neo-colonial argument for the perpetuation of cultural and economic hegemony by a Western civilization that is used to domination. Now my personal view is that the truth lies somewhere between our thinking on human rights cannot be insulated from our religious, cultural, economic, and historical insights. I have to beg to disagree with all those who say that religion or history or culture are, are unimportant. They are uncivilized uh, uh, factors and we must hitch ourselves to the star. Indeed, we should. At the same time, nothing is irrelevant. And I think our attitude has to be holistic. The argument that there are no Asian values is, uh, uh, most humbly I wish to say, is a racist and ethnocentric argument. At the same time, it must be conceded that the Asian values argument has often been used to douse the uh, flames of freedom. Equally, American and European assertions are used to promote a narrow West-centric view of human civilization and to secure unfair advantage for Europe and America in the post-Cold War era. Uh, the intellectual property law, I think, is a, is a good example. A middle path between these two extremes can be blazed. A human rights law with a settled core or a paradigm and a variable penumbra or fringe is a distinct possibility. Number three, the instrumentality of democracy. To most American and European observers, electoral democracy is the surest catalyst for the evolution of a regime of human rights. While this is largely true, I have to humbly submit that majoritarian democracy is not always conducive to the protection of minority rights. Free and fair elections can return racists and fascists to power. Recent examples from Trump's America and Modi's India abound. The imperatives of an electoral contest may actually increase ethnic and religious tensions. Democracy is good for incremental movements, but its ability to bring about fundamental, structural, systemic changes that may be unpopular is open to doubt. Electoral democracy institutionalizes political corruption. It grants disproportionate power to pressure groups and unfair advantages to parties and candidates with funds to mount expensive campaigns. Around the world, electoral democracy has proved no better than authoritarian systems in controlling oligarchies, monopolies, and elements of the deep state. 
the connection between democracy and socioeconomic development is also by no means a necessary one. The fantastic economic rise of China and the endemic poverty in India are illustrative. Nevertheless, a trade-off between democracy and development is not justified. The prioritization or sequencing argument must be rejected. The human rights world needs both democracy and development. Uh, number four, the instrumentality of a free market economy. A free market economy is often seen as a prerequisite to the promotion of a range of creative activities. Uh, a, 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 sorry, a range of creative activities and entrepreneurship which are conducive to the gradual strengthening of human rights. Western thinking is deeply influenced by market capitalism, individualism, and commercial rights. However, there is insufficient recognition of the need to reduce extreme social inequalities and to redistribute wealth and property. The staggering concentration of wealth in the hands of few. The existence of cartel capitalism the exploitation of workers, especially of those who make their products overseas. And the plundering of, plundering of natural resources is very evident. Uh, it, it's sad to note that in many countries there are safeguards for workers internally. But the same companies are allowed to go abroad and to exploit foreign workers. Capitalistic theory does not emphasize the need for structural changes and social restructuring. It rejects limits on the right to property and limits on the right to trade freely in the capitalist market. Now, the ruthless manner in which currency speculators acting within the system impoverished the economies of much of Southeast Asia in the late 90s indicates that the connection between human rights and a free market is by no means an entirely beneficial one. And number five, the fountains of freedom. In our times, we have to concede that human rights have thrived best in the West. But historically speaking, human rights were not born in the crucible of Western civilization. Concern with the dignity of human beings was common to the religious traditions of the East. America and Europe, after centuries of human rights violations, adopted this ethic only in the last half of the 20th century. The widely held belief that the human rights movement is a product of Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture is historically unsupportable and is based on a biased ethnocentric world view. In fact, the ancient religions of the world promoted an ethic of humanity. Uh, time doesn't permit, but may I just mention how in Islam, uh, it says, the Holy Quran says, that Allah is closer to us than our jugular vein. In Christianity, it says very clearly, it is in God's image that man was created. Our next one, number six, human rights and religious restraints. This is perhaps the most controversial area. Most Western legal systems hold it as a cardinal principle of political faith, that law and morality, the state and religion must be clearly demarcated. This brand of militant secularism denies any significant place for religious considerations in the human rights discourse. And I want to admit right away that this is not just in Western legal thought. Actually, great many Asians educated abroad hold the same view that the state must not be involved in the enforcement of religion or morality. And that should be a matter left purely between man and God. However, but look at, look at the contrast. In contrast with the uh, Western uh, value system, 33 nations of the East, as compared to nine of the West, adopt a state religion. Blasphemy is an offense, Mr. Chairman, in 30 Eastern societies compared to 10 Western societies. In most Asian and African societies, the, relig the religious basis of human rights 
is recognized and the political demand for personal liberties is subjected to religious, conventional and moral considerations. For example, homosexuality is an offense in 71 Asian and African societies as compared to zero European legal systems. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to make conclusions as to what the criminal law should or should not do. I'm trying to state the fact that uh, because of religious grounds, this is the reality in legal systems. The modern secular discourse on human rights should not ignore the religious convictions of the population in its formulation of the inalienable rights of human beings. Religious persons will not sacrifice their most firmly rooted convictions at the altar of human rights. I'm not talking of Muslims alone. I'm talking of Muslims and Christians and Jews and Hindus and Sikhs. They will not sacrifice their most firmly rooted convictions at the altar of human rights. If the law is to be internalized and law must be internalized if it is to be effective, it must not depart too far from the moral values of society and its entrenched customs. We need therefore a shared criteria between rational secular morality, if I may call it that, and religious convictions. Let us not forget that practicing one's religion, not just professing, but practicing one's religion is itself a human right. Asian governments, more than Western governments suffer this dilemma. I know in Malaysia we suffer this dilemma. Can the authority of government and the obligation to obey its directives be persuasively defended in purely secular terms or is a religious underpinning required? Must our legal journey walk both the paths together of secularism as well as of religiosity? Uh, legal attitudes, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, uh, number seven, yes, thank you. Number seven, slide, slide 44. Individual rights versus collective uh, welfare. The Western vision of human rights tend to emphasize the individual and his rights against society. Asian societies, on the other hand, Asian civilizations subject individual rights to collective welfare and communitarian and family values to a much larger extent than in the West. Sat Satanic verses by Salman Rushdie was regarded as a clear cut case of freedom of speech. Uh, even uh, um, His Holiness the Pope said that is not so. And uh, in uh, 14 or so nations around the world, there were demonstrations, there were deaths over this issue. Uh, legal attitudes towards blasphemy, pornography, sedition, Treason, uh, showing disrespect to the monarch, are illustrative of this attitude. Singapore law compels children on the basis of Confucius morality to support their aged parents, subject to some exceptions. Islamic law of wills of Asiya and inheritance puts, puts strong obstacles, obstacles in the path of someone who wishes to cut off his close relatives. The law says property must go this way. I know there are other ways of circumventing it. For example, one could give a gift Hiba in his lifetime. But if property passes at death, uh, then the will cannot say, I hereby give to my wife one ringgit. No. That will not be permitted because uh, Islamic law actually allows uh, close relatives. In fact, in Pakistan, they have gone to the extent, the courts have gone to the extent under the Sharia to say, in your lifetime, if you are rich and your relatives are poor, poor relatives have a right to support from the rich relatives. So I think there are communitarian family values. In Asia, considerations of social stability. Uh, sorry, I have lost track here. <laughs> uh, in Asian legal systems, the legislature and the courts view it as one of the essential functions to superintend the moral life of the community. In Western societies, 
the demands of personal autonomy uh, are respected. In fact, they have gone so far that it is often immoral to enforce morals, <laughs> whether it is blasphemy or pornography or disrespect for your flag. In the USA, disrespect for flag is part of free speech. Nothing is sacred. There is belief in nothing. And sometimes this leads to a belief in anything. In Asia, considerations of social stability, peace and harmony are allowed to override the individual's right to express himself freely. Community interests trump individual rights in a far larger area than in the West. Uh, the lack of discipline against COVID-19 restrictions in some Western society is a case in point. Uh, I, I'm not saying that all Asian societies have done better than Western societies. I'm clearly um, conscious of the New Zealand example. New Zealand has done beautifully in combating the COVID problem. I think in many, Ameri uh, many uh, countries like the USA, Germany, Italy, there have been demonstrations against COVID-19 restrictions. I think what is needed is a doctrine of proportionality as a morally neutral balancing doctrine to resolve the tension between individual rights and community interests. Both must be respected. And I think a balance is needed. Uh, next one, uh, rights go hand in hand with duties. The dominant Western liberal philosophy emphasizes an individual's rights, but not his, his or her duties. At least in the constitution, it doesn't. In the COVID-19 era, resistance by many Americans and Europeans to the COVID-19 restraints is a case in point. Asian scholars argue that rights must go hand in hand with duties. In India, the chapter on fundamental rights is accompanied by a chapter on fundamental duties. Some Asian scholars argue that there is no need to adopt an all or nothing approach as with free speech in America. The chapter on human rights must do both confer rights as well as prescribe enumerated restrictions with the judiciary as the balance wheel. I emphasize enumerated restrictions, not restrictions at the women and fancies of the executive, enumerated restrictions with the judiciary as the balance wheel. Next one, the issue of rights versus dignity. Western theory places emphasis on human rights. Many Asian scholars prefer to use the term protection of human dignity as the primary aim of the law. The vocabulary of rights is shunned on the ground that the assertion of some rights is often incompatible with the preservation of human dignity. Human dignity is understood to generate both duties to others and duties to oneself. Another reason for preferring the vocabulary of dignity over rights is that in some circumstances, Assertion of individual rights can lead to the diminishing of the collective welfare and dignity. I, I can think of one clear example. If in a trade union, workers are allowed to indulge in uh, separate uh, agreements with the employer rather than collective agreements by the trade union, uh, that, would, uh, that would uphold the workers' individual right, but at the same time, it would weaken the trade union. Our next one, human rights and private centers of power. I think this is a very important point from the third world perspective. In Western theory, there is emphasis on protection of the individual against the power of the state. The police, the army, the civil service, local authorities. In Asian societies, we recognize that the threat to the rule of law emanates as much from private centers of power as from the state. And it is for this reason that there is a much more tolerant attitude towards state power and near total reliance on the machinery of the government for social engineering. May I just give examples? Domestic abuse, uh, um, uh, keeping domestic servants, uh, sorry, domestic violence, uh, keeping domestic servants in slavery-like conditions, uh, uh, abused by employers of employees, in estates, for example, uh, abused by manufacturers of the rights of consumers. This is all private sector violation. 
and uh, uh, this needs to be combated. And number 11, human rights and international centers of power. Much has been written about the danger to human rights from the dominant power of oppressive authoritarian ruling elites within nation states. Uh, and I acknowledge that uh, uh, this uh, uh, awareness is necessary. At the same time, I have to point out that very little attention is given in contemporary human rights discourse to Western global dominance as a major cause of suppression of human dignity. Human rights violations, sorry, next one. Uh, moral superiority of the West myth of reality. Human rights violations have been committed in all ages and in all territories. No nation has a clean record. Asia and Africa have much to be ashamed of. But anyone who knows history will testify that the nations of Europe and North America have a similarly horrendous record of human rights abuses stretching back a thousand years. For the most part, Western civilization has neither acknowledged its brutal past nor apologized for it. I don't remember seeing any clear-cut apology from the USA about Hiroshima or Nagasaki or Vietnam or Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, at least Japan did apologize and annually apologizes. Uh, uh, about its atrocities after World War II. Uh, globalization and human rights. Globalization is full of glory and hope for the euphoric and loaded with concern and despair for the skeptical. I have to say on the positive side, it has opened up vast vistas of knowledge. As a, a student and teacher, I have benefited immensely from the globalization of knowledge. There is now an alternative source of information, which makes freedom of speech much more real. It means communications have brought the world together. However, in other respects, globalization is a form of colonialism that has anointed itself with a new name. Asians and Africans are being made to sacrifice their culture and heritage to the juggernaut of globalization which is becoming the vehicle of monoculture and the means of commercial, commercial domination. In the process of globalization, the state ceases to play the traditional dominant role. Instead, the market rules supreme. The globalization of the audiovisual media has increased the domination of Western, especially American perspectives, tastes, practices and values. Our kids now uh, don't ask their parents to go and buy satay or uh, goreng. It's, it's burger and KFC and pizzas. Eh? Uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, either of them, but uh, it's a little bit remarkable how actually you hardly get a call and says, can you uh, pick up for me, uh, you know, a little bit of roja from, uh, the Bangsa corner. Globalization is permitting mighty global players to make huge quick profits at crippling social and economic cost to citizens of the host state. I'm, I'm deeply worried actually about many indigenous industries that are dying. Globalization is a danger to democracy in the sense that in a world as a single market, the money dealers rule. Economics is devouring politics. Commerce has become culture. State power has been handed over to financial oligarchs from abroad. Globalization has a very serious authoritarian tendency. It weakens the nation state and compels it to submit to the dictates of the international market. Transnational corporations, international bodies, like the IMF and credit rating institutions like Moody's have now emerged as the principal sites of economic, social, and political power. Social welfare policies are in peril. Globalization is intolerant of state regulation of the economy, even if it is for the benefit of the uh, 
marginalized or uh, uh, weaker sections of society. The juggernaut of globalization is leading to uniform mode of thought, lifestyles and preferences. This is resulting in a civilizational crisis. Non-Western cultures are in danger of annihilation or assimilation. Next one, human rights. The last point, human rights and the war against terrorism. The savagery involved in the killing, maiming, beheading or rape of innocent civilians by terrorists and militants in many Muslim countries is surely a crime against humanity. And there is probably very little disagreement on this point, or there should be very little disagreement. But the bigger picture must also be taken note of. And the bigger picture is this, that terrorism is not new. State terrorism is no less despicable than terrorism by non-state actors. What the world today is witnessing is not a war against terrorists, but a war between terrorists. In the words of Noam Chomsky, September 11 was the first time in history that the West received the kind of attack that it carries out routinely in the rest of the world. Uh, may I go to slide 66? There is much hype about September 11 as having changed the world. In fact, many other September 11s of greater savagery, many of them perpetrated by Europe and America, have gone unrecognized and unmourned because they came from a civilization that is used to doing these things. Next one. There is a global fixation with Islamic terrorism. Um, and this is not in any way to justify Islamic terrorism. It does exist. But this fixation has jeopardized the life and liberty of Muslims everywhere. They are being reviled in the same way Jews were reviled before World War II. Human rights activists are beginning to distinguish. Even human rights activists are beginning to distinguish between political detainees, uh, which is something they criticize, and Islamic extremists whose incarceration is all right. For example, after September 11, nearly 800 people were incarcerated in the USA without charges being filed. Islam bashing and racial profiling have gained acceptability. The root causes of terrorism need to be addressed. The UN, the US, Nations like Israel, UK, Australia need to remember that no nation can ever become so powerful as to snuff out the flame of freedom and the yearning for justice. There will always be people who will be prepared to die on their feet than to live on their knees. I think the root causes of terrorism need to be addressed. Now, coming to my conclusion, there are many ways of viewing human rights. First of all, through the lens of the natural law theory that rights come from a superior source, from the hand of God, or from nature, or from reason. This theory holds that human rights are universal, fundamental, inalienable, transcendental, and uh, they cannot be subjected to any trade-off. Number two, uh, there is the interest theory. According to this theory, Human rights are tools to fulfill certain interests. These interests may be individual interests, community interests, or a mixture of both. Human rights are instruments for promoting the achievement of higher interests and are therefore open to trade-offs. The Western concept of human rights is closer to the natural rights concept. International law is closer to the natural rights concept. It stands out for its individualism, its support for freedom of contract, its emphasis on the right to property, its preference for civil and political liberties over economic rights. The West sees human rights as consisting largely of limitations on the power of the government. It proceeds on the assumption that human rights are universal and transcendental. In contrast, Asian formulations treat human rights as tools for higher ends. 
Asians place individual rights in the backdrop of communitarian goals? Are you strongly in favor of redistribution of property and place emphasis on economic rights side by side with political liberties? In Asian writings, there is increasing recognition that not only the structure of the state, but also private centers of power within the national state pose a threat to human rights. Additionally, there is strong belief that multifarious Western dominated international institutions and forces pose a continuing threat uh, to human rights in Asia and Africa. For example, the manufacturers of COVID-19 uh, uh, um, drugs. Now, they are extremely powerful. There is appeal in Asia and Africa to relativistic and pluralistic values as opposed to monistic and uh, universal values. However, I wish to humbly submit that these differences between the East and the West, the North and the South uh, should not be exaggerated. A large core of shared values also exists between the East and the West, between national and international formulations of the rights of human beings. And I'm happy to report that this core area of shared values is increasing. The challenge is to search for this common core, to expand it and to bridge the gap between theory and reality. The European Union has taught us that despite wide cultural and historical divergences, a common stand on human values can be adopted. I'm fascinated that though historically European nations fought wars with each other, colonized each other, have massive prejudices against each other, but they have a common European court on human rights and they bow their heads uh, before the findings of this court. ASEAN could enhance its intergovernmental cooperation on the protection and promotion of human rights in accordance with the Phnom Penh statement. We could learn from the EU experience. I, I know we have this statement, but uh, in terms of enforcement, uh, uh, we are hampered by our policies of non-interference. All in all, we need to recognize that despite some conflicting values and attitudes, the West and the East, the North and the South can, by adopting holistic attitudes, learn from uh, each other. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your patience, Tan Harizal. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. That, that was a really wonderful uh, session and lecture. Um, you know, I find the, um, the, your thoughts were definitely provoking. Uh, it has very, uh, you know, uh, valid points, obviously, as well as, it, it, you know, undeniably it challenges the way we think and look at things. Um, now, I'd like to open the session and uh, possibly now pass uh, um, uh, the session to my colleague uh, uh, to manage the uh, question and answers uh, session. Um, so, uh, can I invite Harris? Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Arizal. Uh, thanks, Prof, for the presentation. Um, I think we have about 35 minutes for the Q&A session. And just a reminder, we, you can submit your questions in writing through the Q&A uh, box, or if you raise your hands, then uh, you can do it verbally as well. Um, let's see, uh, Prof, earlier you had mentioned about the interplay between different cultures in Asia and also the uh, you know, Western values of human rights, right? Um, I, there's a question here from Ida, but how do you see this, um, you know, how does the differences between cultures and human rights interplay and how, what, what kind of end results do you see? Does human rights depend on culture? Mm -hmm. um, I, I have humbly submitted that actually we cannot ignore culture and religion. The tendency of many intellectuals to say religion, culture, 
it's all a matter of the past. Religion is uh, superstition. Uh, culture is something that we need to root out rather than to respect. I think this is not a, a workable approach because, as I mentioned, law is not simply a matter of formulation. Law must take roots, not only roots in the legal system, it must take roots in our conscience. And it, I think it is impossible uh, to force people to believe in things which run totally counter to their religious or cultural beliefs. My humble suggestion would be this. Um, when it comes to culture and religion, there too actually there are differences of opinion. So I would uh, make this example. If let us say, I, I would give this example. If let us say a particular religious value is contradicting um, a provision of an international uh, human rights um, document, what do we do? I don't think we should simply say either or, because I think there's a lot of scope for um, relativity in both areas. I would examine the human rights document, international document, and see what its interpretations permit. I have to say this to you as a student of law. All legal words are like amoebas, the organism amoeba that changes shape all the time changes shape. Uh, in other words, there is scope for many interpretations. I would interpret the international law document creatively and see whether its interpretation could bring us together with the religious. Further, I would go to the religious text and look at it from many perspectives. I have to say this to you, Harris, all religions, including Islam, are a mansion with many rooms. In other words, there is no one particular interpretation that is the correct. I know, I know people say true Islam, uh, uh, correct interpretation. There are no correct or true interpretations uh, uh, from school to school, within schools, from country to country. There are many interpretations. So I would then examine the various interpretations of the religion and see whether an interpretation could bring us closer to the secular, uh, rational, contemporary view. I know this will be an exercise that will be challenging, but I personally believe that it is possible. I, I, I'll give you my own example. As a Muslim, I, as a practicing Muslim, I will bow my head before the Sharia. I have three daughters and I have two sons. Now, I don't have very much property. Uh, nevertheless, there is a little bit. Should my daughters get half of my sons? I do not wish to do that. So I search for ways to avoid this. I find the technique of hiba, gift. In my lifetime, I can give a hiba or I can create a waka for trust. So that's what I'm suggesting. We need to explore possibilities within religion itself. I gave you the example of Pakistan, where actually uh, courts, Sharia courts have said that uh, poor relatives have a claim over rich relatives. I can give you examples from Indian courts, Sharia courts, Singapore courts, where courts have said, Talak, 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 tiga. In one breath doesn't count as three. It counts as one. Unless it was delivered on three separate occasions. Now, I, I, I have to say this. Uh, I'm not authorized to give an interpretation of Islam. I don't have a ta'uliya. But I'm, what I'm saying is this, that Islam and other religions actually have tremendous scope for diversity. Diversity is inbuilt into all systems of laws and religion as a system of law has diversity. So that's what I would do, Haris. I would look at the international law. I would look at the religious law or cultural uh, practices and try to reinterpret them creatively 
prismatically, prismatically, and try to find any commonality that could satisfy both. But I would not say this overrides that. I think that's the modern attitude of many educated people, but it is counterproductive because it basically means that a large number of people, Muslims, Christians, Jews, and others who are close to their religion will say, you are making it impossible for me to show fidelity to the law. Thanks, Prof. Um, I do agree with you, but I, I think what really complicates matters when it comes to human rights and uh, interpretations of society's values is when that gets interpreted into law, right? Uh, and then it's not uh, society's values anymore, it's the interpretation of the values, right? So how do you see this playing out, right? Um, because in any multicultural, multi-religious society, there's going to be the minority group and the majority group. So how do you find this balance between the different groups? Yes, indeed. Um, um, I mentioned that earlier, uh, Harris, in a democracy, majority rules. That's one of the weaknesses of democratic rule that uh, people tend to forget that democracy is not only majority rule, but with minority rights. But when it comes to passing of laws, majority matters. If I have 51%, um, Harris, sorry, I get to get, I get to pass the laws. So yes, I agree with you. Sometimes minority rights are trampled upon and the minority need not be racial minority. It could actually be uh, consumers. It could be workers. It could be the handicapped. Uh, uh, it could be the aged. Uh, yes. So yes, I, minority rights do get trampled upon. So th there is no simple um, simple uh, panacea here to solve the problem. What is obviously required is uh, more free speech, more consultation, uh, more consultation with affected interests. I, I have on other occasions actually spoken about the need for parliament to be more participative, to be more consultative before it passes the laws through its committee system. I think if we were to talk to each other a little bit more. If it was not a case of top-down decision-making, um, I think the problem that you highlighted, the grave problem that you highlighted, would be more easily possible to solve if we could hear different opinions. So yes, I, I think the problem exists. It can be mitigated by more consultative processes. May I, may I just point out to you uh, as a last point here, actually Harris, before laws are passed, there is procedure in the standing orders for parliamentary committees, which meet upstairs, which can invite the public. But we don't often adopt that. In 63 years, 10 times parliamentary committees have been formed to indulge in consultation. We need to do that as a matter of course. And then, of course, different point of views will come out and possible commonalities will emerge. So, for example, on the issue of homosexuality, there are strong religious views, not only of Muslims, but let's say also of many other faiths. At the same time, one could point out, what about the right to privacy? You know, one could approach this whole issue not as a right to homosexuality, but as the right to privacy. And once you begin to look at it from that way, it opens up a, a new vista of possibilities. Thanks, Prof. Uh, we have a question from Andrew Koo, right? <laughs> Saying that religion is ultimately a relationship between the divine and the individual and only later of the community. Uh, the individual is the building block of society, which is the coming together of individuals to form that society. So why is there an insistence in the East that the community takes precedence? Uh, Andrew is one of my most learned friends and I would always uh, pay very great attention um, to his views. But this statement that individual is the building block of society is obviously a value judgment. Um, one could easily say the same thing. The tribe, the community, 
the ummah <laughs> the nation uh, is uh, the building block of society so i i think this is clearly a matter of uh, value judgment i i personally think uh, uh, andrew uh, we, we need to we need to come together and uh, walk the middle path here i i don't think the individual alone is the building block of society um i certainly don't look at it that way uh, i think to me um family is very important and to me the word family doesn't only include husband and wife and children family includes parents family includes brothers and sisters surely uh, <laughs> so uh, no i don't think individual is the building block of society um i mean it's like telling me or oh, in a motor car uh, um the spark plug or the engine is the building block no no i think so all the parts <laughs> all the parts are important so i i i would just say it's a matter of um it, it, it's a moral assumption that you are making andrew and it's not a bad assumption at all uh the converse on my side is also a moral assumption so we are in the realm of making a moral assumption thank you thanks prof um we have sanan marshall with the hand raised in the option there i'm going to allow you to talk now can you post your question to prof shat yes uh, thank you um uh, th- thank you so much uh, prof uh, uh, sharuki uh, i must say i'm a bit surpri- i mean i i've heard you talk many times uh, in the past uh, uh, before and after the asian financial crisis so i'm a bit surprised that uh, you um take the middle path or even lean towards uh, community uh, uh you emphasize the community uh, in a, in a, in, a, in a sense you know, you know we are <laughs> this is uh, long after 1997 long after uh, quite long after the arab spring uh, the new malaysia is also you know and uh, you know so i'm surprised that um, you know we don't emphasize for example uh more important rights like freedom of conscience you no know, more more towards the individual rather than the community thank you really i'm not so sure what the question is uh, <laughs> yeah, is, uh, yeah uh, I, i was deciding to keep quiet hopefully that you might have picked up yeah, yeah, yeah i'm not so uh, sure so do you do you have a specific question for prof or was it just more of a comment um would you would you agree that your talk would be as applicable before uh the arab spring before the new malaysia as it is now uh, as it is uh, at the uh, do, you, do you think would you change something now that you've seen the arab spring and now that you've seen the new uh, the new malaysia fail the arab spring has failed and new malaysia has failed basically would you change your talk yeah no i won't change my talk i i i we basically what if i understand you correctly how is what uh, uh, lenny speaker is saying is this that i'm talking of things that have gone by i should address myself to more uh, issues which are current freedom of conscience for example uh, i i totally agree with you that they uh, uh, not five or 10 hundreds of contemporary issues have been left out uh, not not deliberately marshal um uh, I'm, i'm bound by the time limit rule here um, um i was worried that the chairman may declare emergency <laughs> after 45 minutes <laughs> so I, i i agree with you there are issues of uh, 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 gender inequality uh, ill treatment of foreign workers um, ill treatment of uh, uh, domestic servants uh and force disappearances contemporary issues so uh, i i apologize yeah this is surely not meant to be a a comprehensive uh, i have to learn from you as to how in 45 minutes uh, to cover the whole uh, panorama of issues i'm sorry i do not know i know but i i'm i'm fully uh, uh, conscious that there are hundreds of uh are uh, the issues uh, by the way marshal we take one whole semester in the university to cover the issue of human rights one whole semester of 14 weeks um 
but uh, Don Harizal. No, no, I, I think you're misunderstanding my question. My question is, there's been a watershed movement, watershed moment in history, uh, which is the Arab Spring and the failure of the new, Mal the failure of the Arab Spring and failure of New Malaysia. And it doesn't seem to be reflected in the tone of your talk, not so much the content. Well, why don't you just make a comment and I will incorporate that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, watershed event, the Arab Spring was a watershed event, but I'm afraid it didn't go very far, isn't it? Uh, in Egypt, uh, the, the government was overthrown. Uh, the, the, the democratic government was overthrown by a coup d'etat supported by the West. Um, uh, I know at this moment uh, in Myanmar, there is a, uh, a significant uh, events taking place. I know there was the 2018 uh, election in Malaysia, but that has been overturned. Yeah, you're right, actually, there's a great deal, a great deal. I, I fully acknowledge that uh, this is not a comprehensive one. When I write it down, I'll, uh, uh, when I make it more detailed, I'll take note of you. I'll be very happy, in fact, to consult with you. But I have to have your contact number somehow. Okay, thank you, thank you. All right, thanks, Anit. Um, Prof, I'm happy that you brought up Myanmar, right? Because uh, Thomas Daniel had asked in the Q&A section, uh, how do you balance the question of upholding the rights of refugees and asylum seekers and the responsibility of a state to its citizens in the midst of a global crisis where resources are scant and times are tough? Yeah, yeah obviously there are no simple questions. Let me just... Uh, off the cuff, uh, give you my instinctive reaction. I think when it comes to issues of survival, food, water, shelter, uh, medicine for those who are dying, I, I think um, we, need to, we need to reach out. Uh, we should not be bothered about issues like whether you are uh, legally here or illegally here, illegal immigrant, asylum seeker, uh, etc. In, in other words, basic necessities of life must be supplied to everyone. Shelter must be given, help must be given to those who are dying or starving or in danger. But yes, when it comes to um, uh, issues like having millions of uh, um, people fleeing to your borders. I think that creates real dilemmas and it is unfair of the world community to uh, uh, just issue uh, um, idealistic uh, proclamations. I think the world community must step in to provide. I think international law must uh, develop on this point that crisis crises which are created um, uh, largely by um, external factors and which are difficult to manage um, by a nation. I think the international community must help out. We, had this, we have the same problem actually on the borders of Pakistan and Afghanistan, in Myanmar, in many other countries. Of course, Palestine is a continuing issue. I think the international community must help out. There are no easy solutions, Daniel. Uh, all that I would say is this. Um, uh, every country should have a duty to save lives uh, and not be saddled by, uh, not be uh, restricted by issues of uh, whether someone here was legally or illegally. Uh, but once that is done, critical aid is supplied. I think after that, the international community must step in to help uh, because if resources are limited, uh, and indeed, uh, what can we do? Thanks, Prof. We have a question here about climate change and environmental protection and how it affects indigenous groups around the world. It's one, I don't think there's an exact question here. Yeah, but Prof, since it's like outside of the general themes of the other questions we're getting, I was wondering whether you have any thoughts on uh, how climate change and environmental protection fits into this whole framework of human rights. Uh, surely climate change is uh, 
intrinsically uh, involved with human rights, especially of vulnerable communities. Um, uh, climate change, um, pollution of rivers, um, uh, destruction of our forests, <laughs> uh, removal uh, of our, the hills. Actually, this has disastrous effects on the lives of uh, uh, the marginalized communities. So human rights, as I mentioned in my talk, is not only about freedom of speech, uh, and issues of New Malaysia and watershed events of uh, uh, in the Middle East, uh, what Marshall was concerned about. Human rights are also about water and shelter and firewood. You know, if you cut down the forest, uh, Harris, um, it's not my land, but at the same time, I was relying on the forest for my firewood. I was relying on the forest. If I were poor, I was relying on the forest for my vegetables. I was relying on the forest for my food. So you are basically depriving me of my basic necessities of life. And I think these issues uh, uh, have been tackled in many countries. India has done a good job uh, in some of these areas of sustainable development. International law is now waking up uh, to this fact. But at the same time, let me mention that many of the Western countries are the great violators in this area. For example, they are dumping toxic wastes in our nations. Toxic wastes will definitely end up not only killing the soil, but the rivers and the fish. Uh, yes, indeed, human rights are um, inextricably interwoven with the environmental climate changes and actually all these are all these are connected ecology teaches us that all this is connected with each other so if the fish are dying in the river uh, it's not just fish dying in the river there are tens of other uh, warning signs we are getting actually um, from this fact i'm all with you that climate change is intrinsically connected with the violation of human rights. Thanks, Prof. We have a question from Tansri Mune Majid. Uh, Prof Shad, where would you place current violations along the spectrum of your understanding of human rights? Rohingya atrocities in Myanmar, current violations by the military in Myanmar, and the Uyghur in Xinjiang. Uh, Tansri, thank you very much for that question. Um, I just wish to inform you that uh, um, I think it was last year, or was it uh, towards the end of 2019, I had the privilege of being one of the organizers of an international tribunal on the Rohingya issue. We heard evidence from uh, people who were themselves victims. And uh, I, I would think that uh, the violation that took place were grave. Uh, they were crimes against humanity. Uh, they were uh, um, actually amounting to genocide, clearly. Now, whether that should come to the uh, um, Houses were burned, women were raped, um, people were expelled from their homes. Um, I would think uh, on the range of six to seven out of 10, surely it was as serious as that. Um, um, I, don't, I do not know of evidence of um, mass shooting or killing uh, as in the Nazi camps, but surely these people were expelled and uh, uh, they had nowhere to go. Uh, their, their villages were destroyed. Their crops were destroyed. Uh, their women were raped. And there were many deaths indeed also. Their citizenship was taken away. They were all, many of them were asked to submit their citizenship papers for verification. And once they submitted the papers, the papers were never returned. 
and as such, because the papers were not returned, therefore they have no proof that they were citizens. So yes, I would say very high. Up. I would definitely put it above five, between five and seven. Yes, thank you. All right, thanks, Prof. Um, let's see, I think we have about nine minutes left. So I'm going to pose one more question before passing the floor back to Inchit Harizal. Uh, Prof, we talked a lot about the importance of human rights, where it's gone wrong and all that, right? Um, City Marina had asked that, you know, all that is true, but in your opinion, how do we close the gap between theory and practice and what, how can we improve the implementation of these human rights principles, right? Yeah, closing the gap between theory and reality uh, uh, is always a challenge and... Uh, Obviously, it requires a, a government that is uh, determined um, to do this. It requires leadership um, that does not only pander to public opinion. I'm reminded of uh, this famous quotation that leaders of substance do not follow opinion polls. They mold opinion, not with guns or dollars or position, but with the power of their souls. In other words, you've got to do things which need to be done. It doesn't matter what the public may say. Uh, one doesn't um, just drink um, from um, uh, the views of the, of the market. Uh, one doesn't just drink from the market fountain. Uh, one actually has a, a higher basis. Good leadership, obviously citizens have a role to play, um, NGOs, um, um, uh, groups like ISIS, um, think, ta think tanks like ISIS, I think we have a role to play. Um, um, and uh, I'm also reminded again of a beautiful quotation, it says, it's not the law that makes us free, it's we that make the law free. In other words, all of us as citizens have a role to play. And I can say this, that in this country, um, over the years, over the decades, uh, I've witnessed myself, you know, in the 70s, the consumer movement was regarded as uh, outlandish. They were anti-trade and commerce. They were uh, uh, regarded as uh, uh, a nuisance. But now actually, consumer movement has become mainstream. Uh, human rights groups, um, uh, electoral reform groups were at one time regarded with great suspicion, but I think now everyone accepts them. So uh, I think leadership, but we can't entirely rely on leadership because in democratic elections, leaders have the most prominent job for them is to get reelected. <laughs> and to say and do whatever is necessary for getting re-elected. So I think citizens and citizens groups can play a role, but whatever it is, uh, uh, Tato, uh, uh, it will be evolution. Uh, I think it is evolutionary changes that are more likely to last. I think the process will be slow, but sure. And I think we should stay stay with it. I, I'm, I'm quite, I, I'm, I'm quite hopeful that actually a public opinion is growing in this country. Number of NGOs that speak up uh, and will not be silenced easily is, is increasing. For example, in the area of gender equality, there's a great deal of work that has been accomplished, although of course much more needs to be done in the area of human rights. So um, there are no simple solutions, but I know the gap is very broad. Actually, the gap is very broad not only in the area of human rights, the gap is very broad in uh, every area. Um, theory is one thing, uh, reality is another. And I think that's part of the challenge. Judges have to play a role. Uh, that's one area where um, in this country, the judiciary has not played a significant enough role. We have had many uh, good steps forward 
and immediately steps backward <laughs> uh, in uh, 2019, 2020, we had some excellent, 2018, 19, 20, we had some excellent judicial decisions, for example, um, to the effect, Alma Nudo Atenza says, the word law in the Constitution's Article 5 does not mean any law whatsoever passed by Parliament. It means a law that is proportionate. In other words, the courts have the power of judicial review to examine the law passed by Parliament. Uh, we have such excellent decisions. At the same time, we have more recent decisions where the judges are um, taking a giant leap backwards to say, if Parliament says so, um, and that's the way it is, that's the law, and judges are bound to follow uh, the law of Parliament. So um, I, I think um, many, many institutions can get together, good leadership, executive, legislature through committee processes, public opinion. Uh, it's a slow process, it's an evolutionary process, and uh, we have to keep on trying. Thanks, Prof. Uh, I see that Tan Sri Mune has his hand up, so I'm going to let Tan Sri have a few minutes before closing. Tan Sri? Okay, thank you, uh, Harris. I think uh, I'd like to thank Professor Shad for his uh, answer, of, of, but it's only one third of the three um, issues that I had raised. I mean, the Rohingya atrocities are uh, very well documented and, and it's uh, given. Uh, is a come up for, 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 for Aung San Suu Kyi in many ways. Mm -hmm. But I also had asked about what is your assessment from a human rights perspective of the current military actions in Myanmar, okay? And also, what is your take over the very tricky issue of the treatment of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang? I mean, those were the two other parts of my question, which, which you had an answer. Thank you very much. Sorry. I'm sorry I didn't get to hear that. Xinjiang must be um, some problem over the mic. Um, oh, the, the coup d'etat surely is uh, 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 absolutely illegal, undemocratic, a violation of uh, human rights, a fraud on the electoral process. Um, international um, uh, observers had witnessed the election and concluded the election was fair. Um, and the military says, no, the election was improper and so it, it takes over. And I think um, the way the citizens are pouring out into the public square, despite uh, warning by the military is also an indication of how strong the feelings run. So my take on that clearly is, uh, Tansri, that the present coup d'etat is in no way justified. Absolutely no way justified. I mean, there may be some circumstances where a nation is, uh, uh, is dying, uh, and then the dilemma may be whether the nation should be allowed to perish so that democracy can survive. Uh, there may be some revolutionary changes that may well be justifiable. Um, jurisprudence has handled that issue in many countries, like in Uganda, in Pakistan, where uh, in some circumstances, courts have said revolutions uh, may generate a new grand norm, but surely uh, this is not so. Uh, this there is absolutely no justification that I can think of. Uh, actually, Tansri, even before the revolution, the army was insisting on all sorts of improper um, uh, authoritarian measures. For example, if I remember correctly, 25% of the parliamentary seats in parliament were reserved for the army. Now, why should that be so? So there was never, never a, a democracy really, and uh, uh, the minorities were being uh, subjected to geno genocide 
even before the revolution. Um, then as to the, what is happening in, in, in China, indeed, yes, I think we cannot have double standards. Uh, I think we have to uh, condemn human rights violations wherever they are taking place and no matter uh, who, who is committing them. Um, uh, I, um, from the little bit of inf information that I have, clearly uh, there are grave violations of human rights uh, going on there. Um, genocide, I think, is taking place uh, even in some regions of uh, uh, China. And I think these need to be pointed out and the United Nations at least should take a stand. I, I know that the Security Council is crippled because of the uh, Security Council it is basically a victor's club uh, after World War II. So there will be that veto. Uh, nevertheless, I think at the General Assembly, a stand should be taken on genocide taking place in China and in Myanmar and in Palestine, in Syria, in Lebanon, many other parts of Africa. The theaters of suffering are many indeed, and it's very sad. Thank you, Tansri. Thanks, Tansri. Thanks, Prof. I think that's all the time we have. Uh, may I please pass the floor back to Inchit Harizal for the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Haris. Uh, first of all, thank you, Prof. And, um, you know, I mean, Haris just mentioned that that's all the time that we have, but I indeed have another question, or at least a remark. So I'm going to I'm gonna sort of like rephrase or change that, uh, you know, from a question to a remark. I think, Prof, you have brilliantly laid out uh, you know this lecture about the evolving sort of like you know one of the parts of your lecture is about the evolving nature of, uh, of, of rights itself and how you know uh, uh, societies and individuals for instance view what uh, 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 you know our, our defined rights um, I think uh, I think you know in my personal uh, capacity in my some of my experience uh, in the past I have seen this played out, you know, in real life. And if I may share, share one, one particular example, uh, you know, I was organizing the first presidential elections in Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, we, you know, a lot of the field workers were doing it uh, because we believe it's the right for the uh, people in Afghanistan to choose their leaders. Uh, but when we went to the ground, we had a very big problem because uh, the women refused to remove their burqa. Uh, for, for their photos to be taken for their um, uh, uh, voters' card. Um, uh, and, and we as election, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, practitioners need to ensure uh, that, 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 you know, uh, we, could, we could actually record, uh, you know, every single voters. Uh, so we were basically faced with, you know, a, a very clear sort of like, you know, a dilemma at that time on how to move forward. And obviously there was a solution to that, but my point is that, um, uh, things evolve. I think the younger generation now uh, basically views uh, rights in, uh, you know, more sort of like uh, uh, different ways than probably when I was even, you know, a, a practitioner in this field and, and considered as to be the defender of, of, of human rights. Um, I, I hope, um, you know, through this talk and everybody that, uh, you know, who, who are attending this, uh, this, this talk today uh, realize that this is uh, going to continue to be something that we have to monitor closely we have to put our attention to, and we probably have to address it uh, uh, when the time comes. I do not think there is one uh, uh, solution or answer, uh, you know, to every single sort of like, you know, uh, rights issues. On one hand, we try to, uh, you know, protect something, but by doing that, we might have infringed, um, you know, uh, uh, certain rights. Uh, on that note, I thank you very much, uh, Prof Shad. I thank you everyone for attending the session this morning. Uh, thank you, Haris, for co-moderating. And obviously, thank you very much uh, to all my colleagues at ISIS, uh, uh, you know, that have made this uh, session possible this morning. Um, thank you, Prof, again, and assalamu alaikum. Have a wonderful work week ahead. Thank you. Thank you.